Level up your developer career. How to advance as a software developer. So my name is Jeff Ammons. I am CEO and Chief Instructor at Code Career Academy. I've been writing code professionally for more than 25 years. I am a Microsoft MVP and a Pluralsight author. And so I am going to talk to you today about how to level up your career. If you're already a software developer, maybe you're a junior developer or a mid-level developer, and you're thinking, how can I go to that next level? That's what we're going to talk about today. So if you'll put your name and location in the comments down there with any questions, or if you just want me to say hello to you, that would be fun too. I will, as soon as I see the, uh, the comments, I don't get them instantly. There's a bit of a delay, so I will get to them as quickly as I can. All right, so tell me, does this sound like you? Well, I'm pretty good with jQuery, but I'd like to really understand JavaScript, especially ES6. Or, you know, I've been doing front-end development for a while, but I'd like to, I'd like to get into the back-end server-side piece as well. Ah, hi, Ron. Just saw you down there. Also, there just aren't as many jobs available in the stack I'm working with. This, this is one that's quite common because often we pick the technology stacks that we're going to learn based on what we see as popular with developers, and that's not always the same as popular with hiring managers. So, you know, a lot of times people are working, but they see the grass looks greener on the other side in terms of finding more jobs and better paying jobs. So that's why you might be saying something like, I'd like to learn C Sharp and .NET because I see tons of job listings and the pay is usually pretty great for .NET developers. So let's talk about what does it actually take for you to level up. Well, basic intelligence, that's kind of obvious. You couldn't have gotten where you are as a, as a developer already without the minimum level of intelligence. Logical thinking, you just for all programming, you have to be able to think through a problem break it down into parts and solve the individual parts in a repetitive way. Hard work, there's no two ways about it. If you're going to go to work, do your job, come home, watch TV, play games, uh, hang out, uh, that's not going to get you ahead as much as putting in the extra time and the extra energy and the extra effort to be the person who is moving ahead and learning the new stuff. Working smart is also very, very crucial because you know, if I work 80 hours, you know, a week and I'm studying something really, really hard that no one's hiring for, yes, I will have learned something in the process, but it will not be immediately applicable or have an immediate return on my investment. Next comes straight up practice. You know, as whether you're starting off with no experience and you want to become a developer or you are already a developer and you want to go to that next level, you have to write a lot of code. There's no substitute for writing lots and lots of code. It's the same as learning a, a musical instrument. If you wanted to learn to play the piano or become better at playing the piano, you know, you can read all of the books on music theory, watch all kinds of videos, but till you actually put in the hours sitting there playing the music over and over and over, you don't really get better at it. So after practice comes practice. Uh, you may guess what comes after practice. It's more practice. And then after that becomes more practice. And not just, you know, any, any kind of practice. I, I like to say, you know, build real projects. Build real projects and try to do it in such a way that you are um, not relying on frameworks and libraries as much as you are writing more of it yourself. So what this really boils down to is time and commitment. You know, you could work really, really uh, a long time as a developer without advancing. And a lot of it comes down to, did you put in the extra time and did you have the commitment to keep learning? Okay, again, for anyone who has just joined, let me refresh my view over here to see what it tells me. It doesn't tell me how many people are, are watching at the moment. So... I'm going to assume, Ron, maybe you're still there. Anyone else, if you are just joining us, this is Level Up Your Dev Career, How to Advance as a Software Developer. And um, get back over here. Again, I am Jeff Ammons, CEO, Chief Instructor, Code Career Academy, blah, blah, blah. Let's keep going. If you are just joining, put your name and location in the comments with any questions you have or if you just want me to say hi. So let's go back to say, is that time and commitment worth it? You know, is it really going to help you out? So let's look at, you know, as a programmer, you know, if you're a junior level programmer, you're probably already making a fair living. 
Um, if we look here, this is from U.S. News, and this is their money site on best jobs for and l the listing of the specific title computer programmer. So the average nationally is about 79k. Uh, the 75th percentile, you're breaking six figures. 25th percentile, you're down around 60k. And let's go forward from there. So compare that to other developers, other jobs in their best jobs listing. They break out software developer, computer programmer, and web developer as separate, but you, you probably already know that those really are different flavors of the same career path. You know, if you learn to be a web developer and you continue to study and you learn uh, one of the uh, languages that are useful for things other than web, you can consider yourself a software developer or computer programmer. It's often you're called whatever the company decides to call you. In my 25 plus years as a developer, I've been called a lot of different things. Some nice and some not so nice. Everything from junior developer to um, solutions architect or principal architect. And at the end of the day, in all of those jobs, I was writing code. There, there's a commonality through all of those. And if you look at this list, most people would identify that almost all of these jobs in some way, shape, or form are developer, except civil engineer. Okay, so if we look at 2016, this is breaking it down into Atlanta. So this is showing that the average person with a title of computer programmer in Atlanta in 2016 had a median average of 60K. You know, that's not terrible. Jump forwards to 2017, though, and on the same chart, they've bumped it up to 72K as the median. So what this says is as a developer of any level, you've probably got a fair shot at a decent um, income. But if you project that forwards to where you can go if you really dig in. Uh, another thing I'll point out there is if you'll notice at the top, it says the highest paying skills associated with this job are C-sharp programming language, C-sharp and Oracle. So if you put in the time, energy and effort to advance, where can you go? So uh, let's jump one more. Let's look at architect. So kind of at the high end of someone who writes code is typically the solutions architect. You, you generally come to a fork in the road as a developer and you either go the route of architect or management. And there are ups and downs on both sides. If you are more interested in writing code than in working managing people, then architect is a good choice. If you want to be a manager and manage people more than write code, then the, the management route's a good choice. But here's an example of if you decide to stay completely within the technical realm, and become an architect. For 2016, for the Atlanta area, the median income for an architect was 112. Jump that forward to 2017, and the median income became 125. So this is typically someone with about 10 years of experience or so, and your range will be somewhere in between. So as you start to progress, you can expect to earn more. But you know, one of the things that I, I tell my students is you don't automatically earn more. You have to play the game right. And that's why when I created this company, I didn't just call it Code Academy. I called it Code Career Academy because I want to help you manage your career. Because trust me, no one else is going to help you manage your career except you. And the only thing I can do is try to give you pointers and guidelines. But you have to do the work of managing your own career. And one of the bits of information that I, I give students is... The way to keep your, your salary really low is to get into a starter job and stay there forever. You know, if you're lucky, you're going to get the 3% bumps each year. The way you make the real jumps is by going above and beyond, by going out and getting your own training, your own, whether it's, you know, we'll go through a bunch of different ways that you could get the training, but get yourself ready to level up by learning new technologies, then showing the world that you've learned those new technologies. Once you do that, you can then look for another company that's using that newer technology. And now you can make, instead of a 3% raise, you can jump up in, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20% pay raise by switching jobs to a new company that's looking for a new technology that you have publicized the fact that you have been learning. So let's move on. So now, you tell me, based on those numbers, if it's worth it to you. This is my cheese ball slide right here. So um, show of hands in the comments if that's cheesy enough or should it be cheesier. I can, I can make it cheesier. Okay, if anyone has just joined, this is Level Up Your Dev Career, How to Advance as a Software Developer. Would, 
for some reason my sound just came back on did, did you mute that oh so i am jeff ammons i am ceo chief instructor code career academy and i'm talking to you about how to level up your developer career if you're just joining us in here put your name and your location into the comments if you have any questions put those in there as well and i'll be sure to say hi okay okay so awesome let's say that i've now decided i'm a junior developer a mid-level developer and i want to try to get to that architect position how do i get there from where i am right now so we've got a number of different options you know you you know you're going to have to study you know you're going to have to learn some new technology how are you going to do it well first off there's more than one path and none not there's not one path that i can say is absolutely right for everybody so i'm going to tell you what several paths are and you can decide which one makes sense for you so the first one that everyone thinks about is the four-year computer science degree there's a, a lot of us in the field who don't have cs degrees either we're self-taught or we have some other degree or or some other way we made it into the industry without a cs degree if that's you, then you may be thinking, well, maybe I need to go back for a four-year degree. And that's, a, that's one viable option. Another one that you could consider is the Code Boot Camp or Intensive School. This is the kind of program that I run where I bring you in for six or more months. Ah, we got someone from Lawrenceville. Victor. Hi, Victor. Glad you could join us. Um, code School or intensive school boot camp that kind of a thing that's another option a lot of people only think of this in terms of well that's for beginners who are just trying to get into a programming career but one of the things that i do in my classes okay hang on one second let me go back okay ron it says ron's question says would you recommend a coding boot camp or a community college university programming certificate for a person looking to transition to product management? I have a BS in business and I work in tech currently. I have been self-studying for a year, but would like more guidance. Okay, Ron, I'm going to be talking about that exactly in here. And just to, let me go through a couple more slides, then I'll come back to your exact question and in, 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 in details. Because I've got kind of the generic general purpose answer in the slides already. And then I'll come back and add in info about your specific question. Because that's where I'm headed next here is, is on exactly that. And self-study. So as, as Ron has just said, he's going down the self-study route. And that's one of the very valid options. And we're going to talk about comparing them. So if we look at the four-year computer science degree... You know, it's going to be a bit of a shock when you learn that that probably takes about four years. I know. I, I had no way to guess from the, the name either. Uh, but anyway, for most people, you know, a lot of us, like, like Ron's case here, he's already got a bachelor's degree in something. So does it make sense to go back for a four-year degree? I don't really think so in a case like yours, Ron, for a four-year degree. I'm, I know you're asking about community college, and I'll, I'll cover that in a second. But the... Um, for someone who's thinking of a four-year complete computer science degree, if you've already got a degree in something, I think there are faster ways to get there and less expensive because we all know how expensive it is to go to a university these days. It's, uh, as you can see on the slide, quite expensive. Okay, coding boot camp. This is getting closer to your question here, Ron. A coding boot camp, it, um, they generally are from 8 to 23, 27 weeks in length really really widespread in, in in what they offer uh usually seven thousand to twenty thousand dollars total investment by the time you get out of there uh the advantage on that side is it's going to be super hands-on this is going to be you're actually building stuff constantly building stuff and that is kind of the stock and trade of the boot camp self-study okay this is the one and Ron, you can back me up on this one. Have you ever felt like you were out there on Mars all by yourself when you're trying to self-study? You have questions and there's nobody really to ask. You, you're not sure which things should I study? Should I study this language or that language? Where do I find out? I'm looking online. I see one place online they say study this. Another says don't ever study that. Study this other thing. And so it's, it can be very, very frustrating and lonely when you're trying to study by yourself. I liken it to going to the gym. You know, if you're going to the gym with a buddy, you're a lot more likely to go to the gym and you're a lot more likely to keep going to the gym and make progress. Self-study 
is perfectly valid. And um, by how long will it take is another question. And the answer to that is nobody knows. It really depends on how it goes for you. If you know you are really super successful in you know choosing stuff then you know it could be as little as two years but it could be six or more years it depends on how much time you put into it how much success you had it's really up in the air with a self-study route and in terms of price you know, you're going to pay something you're going to be buying books and videos and courses and whatnot uh I wild guess between a thousand and six thousand dollars but really who knows i'm i i pull those numbers out of the air because I'm guessing you'll have to buy some amount of stuff, but since I don't know how long it'll take or which path you will take, can't get much more specific than that. And the real problem with it is you're on your own. Okay, so when you start diving down into uh, which route you want to go, whether it's a college, a boot camp, or self-study, they're not all equal and you're gonna to have to do your research. You're gonna to have to really dig in to find out which programs work for you. So here are some tips for selecting a boot camp if you decide to go that route. Uh, course Report is kind of like the Yelp for boot camps. So coursereport.com, if you wanna check us out, we're there at school slash Code Career Academy. And on there, not only do you get reviews that students have left of schools, you can also see where the course report folks themselves write a bunch of informative articles and they post a lot of stuff on there that can be very helpful. Uh, next on the list will be switchup.org. They are kind of second place behind um, course report, I'd say, but they're growing very quickly and a lot of people are starting to go to switchup as well. So you've got to um, check which technologies that the boot camps are teaching or colleges you know this is where you know you start to question you know is this what's going to get me the job i want and so one of the things you need to do is check to see which technology stack are they they teaching and is it a technology stack for which there are jobs in my area and i'll show you in a minute how to find that out so how about that self-study route we've talked about that one just a second ago there are a lot of different routes that you can take you know Pluralsight is probably my favorite online study place. Um, I did a, a blog post back in like 2000, I don't remember, 2013 maybe, called that Pluralsight is my secret weapon because I was using it to um, learn lots of new technology. You can watch videos on your lunch break, whatever. O'Reilly Books, probably my favorite uh, publisher. If you want to go deep on JavaScript, Eric Elliott does a lot of stuff. And we are rolling out an online study option here at a sister website we call ccalearn.tech. More on that in a little bit. Let's get back to talking about which technologies that you want to pick up on. Uh, most of the places that are our boot camps are going to focus on web technology because web technology is the most widespread. If someone is looking, you know, if, you, if you were to at random pick a developer out of the world, they're probably doing, you know, web development because there's more web development than any other kind of web, probably all other kinds of development put together. But if, if you look to see what is the boot camp teaching on the front end, it's probably going to be pretty similar. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, because that's what the front end is. That's, uh, there's not a lot of variety there. Beyond that, you get into frameworks and libraries and whatnot. But overall, we're all going to teach pretty much the same on the front end. It's on the back end that things start to differentiate. On the back end is where we have lots of different choices, you know, and you really start with which computer, which programming language do you like to do and are there jobs for it? So if we break down by language, we've got JavaScript, you could do Node.js on the server. If you want to do Java, you could do Java EE. There's a couple other varieties there too. C Sharp pairs up with ASP.NET, Ruby, Ruby on Rails. Uh, there's a, in, in each of these cases, there are some other alternatives, but with lower job numbers. Uh, so let's see, how do we evaluate them? In general, if you go to Career Builder or one of the other sites and you put these technologies in and look for how many jobs are listed in the local area, I say that because I'm in the Atlanta area and I suspect most of the folks online may be too. I know, Victor, you're in Lawrenceville, which is the same as us. Ron, I'm not sure where, you didn't say where you were from, but I'm gonna assume probably the Atlanta area somewhere. Um, you want to look for 
where either where you live currently or where you want to live because you want to see which which jobs are available in the area where I want to live because it doesn't do me a lot of good to study a language that no one's hiring for in the area where I want to be. So if we look at the Atlanta area, it tends to break down into a two horse race really on the back end. You've got Java and you've got C Sharp. Those are the two main, uh, ah, Sandy Springs, good run. So you are exactly within our sphere of reference here. So. Um, if you look in the Atlanta area, typically at any given time, Java and C Sharp have a similar number of jobs. It ranges between about 120 and 180 on a given day. And so it will fluctuate up and down. One day C Sharp has more. Yep, I saw that. And another one, another day Java will be on top and then C Sharp, then Java. Java script is always in there, but not that doesn't mean the server side. You have to look at Node specifically to know if it's a server side job. Um, because JavaScript pairs with everything else. No matter what else you study, you have to know JavaScript. Um, Ruby on Rails tends to be down in the 10 to 18, 10 to 20 range for jobs. Python somewhere around 40 to 50. So it really it depends on what you're wanting to do and which which you know how many jobs are there. So my recommendation is to pair JavaScript with either Java or C Sharp for the Atlanta area. Now, if you're in a different area, you need to check your listing to see what's up and what's down in your area. Again, this is level up your dev career and how to advance as a software developer. I've got these slides every so often through here because with these live streams, you never know when someone's gonna join. I am Jeff Ammons, CEO and Chief Instructor at Code Career Academy, and I'll be your host today as we go through the wonderful world of leaving your name in the comments. So if you put your name questions in the comments, I'll get back to them in just a second, or if you just want me to say hi. Okay, so let's pause for just a second right here, Ron, and go back to your original question here. So you're looking at going into product management. So as a product manager, um, I'm going to assume in, in a web product, or it really doesn't much matter, but you're going to want to, um, it depends on the, the company and how they define the role of the product manager, right? In some companies, the product manager is going to purely be a marketing position. In some companies, it's going to be a marketing position plus a technical position. And in some companies, it's going to be a technical position. So it really is across the there's a spectrum of where you want to fall in there. And it really comes down to how technical do you need to be for your specific case. Um, I would have to know more details about exactly what you're wanting to do to give you a really, really sharp answer. But in general, uh, if you're trying to decide between a programming certificate from a university, a community college, or a boot camp, um, you've got to ask yourself which is more important to you the piece of paper or the experience you're taking away at hands-on level and that is kind of the difference between if you go to a university now it's it's no question if you go to georgia tech and you get a degree from georgia tech you know people are going to love it if you go to a, a different university then it's coming down just a little bit on how much that paper gets respected because at the end of the day what is that diploma or that certificate other than a piece of paper that says you came and you passed someone's test. And that is a way that an employer tries to say, does this person know what they're doing? Is this person going to be able to give me value? So on the one hand, you've got, you know, here's a piece of paper. On the other hand, you have the idea of a, of a portfolio. So what you're going to get from a boot camp is going to be a portfolio of work and the experience of hands-on building a bunch of projects. And building those projects on hand will, by hand, will give you insight into, as a product manager, if you are more of a marketing product manager, like you were saying, your background was really um, business. So for you, what you're probably thinking is, you know, how do I make sure that I know what the developers are doing? How do I ask them reasonable questions of what to build? How do I estimate how long something's going to take? How do I know if this is a hard thing to implement or an easy thing? Is it going to be quick or is it going to be slow? You know, these are usually the kind of questions that someone with a business background coming into a product manager role wants to know. They want to be able to not necessarily build the product themselves, but they want to be at least able to reasonably talk to those developers and understand a you know if they're asking something that's impossible or b 
or the developer's telling me something that just doesn't quite add up with my experience. So that's where you know it comes in really handy um, to have that the actual hands-on experience. So you could be successful with either of those three approaches, and it really depends. Now uh, that we take away the idea of piece of paper versus experience, let's take it down to the second level of evaluation, time, which is going to take you longer. You know, if you go to a university or even a, a, a community college, it's going to take you a longer period of time than it does in a boot camp. Boot camps have, like I said, they're all over the place. There are some places will tell you they'll, they'll make you a full stack web developer in eight weeks. And then there are people like me who say, that's just not quite realistic. I have a program that's six months long. It's a part-time program that lets you meet two evenings a week plus half a day on Saturday. Either you can come in in person or you can remote in. But I think to really, really get any level of proficiency, six months is about what it's going to take. You know, if, if you're trying to go to a shorter program, I, I think what winds up happening is that the quantity of information that has to be blasted at you is blasted at you at a speed at which most people cannot absorb it. I use the example of, you know, a coffee cup. If I have a coffee cup that'll hold exactly one cup of water, if I carefully pour in one cup of water, I have one cup of water in this coffee cup. If I take a five gallon bucket and I dump five gallons of water over top of that cup, I still get the exact same amount retained in the cup. That's why I have a longer course length because I think it takes time for people to absorb the information they're getting. And I also think that it's really the practice of building those projects that gives you what you need, not just the information coming past you. So um, that's kind of where I come from when, it, uh, when, you, when you think about which of these programs. You could be successful with all of them. It comes down to which, which one fits what you're looking for and which one fits your time frame. And then last, which one fits your budget because you know, if you go to a university, it's probably going to be the most expensive. Community college, probably second most expensive. That was really strange. I'm seeing, I see motion on my monitor to my left, and I look over, and I see the video, and it's got little like buttons floating across the screen. I don't know why. I don't do a lot of Facebook Live videos, so uh, that kind of surprised me. Um, so anyway, Ron, if you could give me, if you want to in the comments, give me some extra details on exactly what you're looking for. I could try to go deeper, or if that's enough for right now, then we'll leave it at that. And if you'd like to have an offline conversation with me, call me and, and we'll, we'll talk about it. I'll try to give you some additional specifics for you. Okay, so let's get into, you know, I mentioned the program that I teach, so let's go through kind of what it is I teach and how I do it. So I break up my program into four big chunks. The introduction to web development, the front-end web development, back-end web development with C-sharp and the Microsoft stack, and then data and advanced topics, which is computer science. This is where we do a survey of computer science topics. Okay, so in any program, what's important? Uh, I think that especially if you are trying to level up a career, but it's also true if you're starting, you want something that's going to be low-level, and by low level, I mean I'm not saying, hey, let's 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 understand how how to use this framework or that library, as much as I am saying, let's understand this programming language, let's understand JavaScript, let's understand C sharp, let's understand how to build things with CSS before we pick up something that makes it easy in terms of a framework. So low level, hands on. You really want to make sure that you know I'm not just attending a bunch of lectures where you do quizzes and you, you, you fill out tests, and at the end of the day, you didn't really build anything, because building is where you really learn. Go back to my piano playing. That's where you're actually practicing. Uh, back to basics. This can be incredibly valuable to someone who's already a developer. This is the person who, in my original initial thing, I said, I'm great with jQuery, but I don't really do JavaScript, or I have been doing front end for a while, but I haven't really done back end it can be very helpful to take that step back and relearn things that you already know. You know, maybe you've been doing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript via Bootstrap or Material Design, all these different libraries, frameworks, maybe even Angular or Vue or React, but 
you know, just between you and me, you do a lot of t spend a lot of time on Stack Overflow. You copy and paste some stuff. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you don't know why it either worked or didn't work. Uh, going back to basics and pounding yourself through the hard way of building things up with nothing but a text editor, that can be incredibly helpful in getting you to the point where you're confident. Because one of the things that as a junior developer holds you back is that lack of confidence because you're pretty sure the framework and the tools are doing the work and you're just kind of poking the parts together. Uh, when you go back to hands-on and back to basics and you build it from the ground up, you know what you know and you know that you could sit there with nothing but a text editor or a, a piece of paper and a pencil and you can write code. Um, data structures, algorithms, algorithm analysis. We're going to talk about this one in a minute, but this is kind of a cornerstone in computer science. And this is one that's lacking in a lot of um, programs, a lot of boot camp programs. So if we compare a university program to a boot camp program, at a university program, they're going to get you data structures, algorithms, algorithm analysis pretty quick in. And you're going to go deep on theory, deep on computer science, but not so deep on having built a whole lot of projects for a portfolio. And I mean real world projects. I spoke to a, a guy who's a student at, um, I'll just say a local university. And, you know, we were talking about portfolios and he was asking me, well, how do I build a portfolio? And I, I asked him, what have they had you build so far? And he, he was studying Java and they had him, the most interesting thing they'd had him build so far was an elevator simulator. Now I'm familiar with that particular one. It's like, how do you route the elevator? How do you efficiently make sure the elevator is going up and down the, so that it gets people where they're going? Because you don't want it to always go to the, you know, at, at a timed event because then you wind up with someone standing on the first floor a lot longer while it goes all the way up and back down. This is a, a scheduling thing. That's a good practice but odds are good that no one's hiring someone to do that. When I say a, a portfolio, I want it to be a portfolio of very realistic business style applications. And this is what I have you build in my program is the kind of applications where you have users are getting data in and out of a database via screens, via web pages. You know, you're either having the kind of traditional post back kind of a thing where you know a page gets built sent down they fill in the data they post it back it's going to the database or you're building an API and consuming it with JavaScript either directly with JavaScript or via one of the frameworks like Angular or React and um, but this is kind of a whole microcosm so in my class we build a lot of these projects by the end where they are you know they're not huge projects, but they're replicas of a complete project. An example being, we always do a quiz app game, a quiz game app. And so in this case, what we build is we have a server piece and we have a database piece. So we're storing all of the questions and answers in the database. And you can log in as an administrator and add new questions and new answers. And that's all with a traditional MVC style application. And then, we build a, an API that can hand back questions and check answers. And then we use plain vanilla JavaScript to build an interactive dynamic UI that consumes via Ajax that REST API and plays the game basically. So it's not a huge project, but it has all the pieces that you would have in a, in a modern business application. All right, let me check the comments to see if anybody else has one. Don't see any new ones, so we'll we'll keep on trucking here. Oh, I gotta click back onto the every time I click off to the side to look at the comments, I have to remember to come back and click on PowerPoint or it doesn't react to my little clicky here. Okay, the languages that I teach are JavaScript and C sharp because in the Atlanta area, the only other stack that would rival this would be JavaScript and Java. And I personally prefer C sharp over Java. I've done both considerable amounts of time. Uh, the way I explain the difference in C Sharp and Java is that if you take C Sharp and you take away my favorite parts, you've got Java. Nothing wrong with Java, and if C Sharp didn't exist, I could, I could make a happy living doing Java. But C Sharp has a lot of little nice things that Microsoft had built in that make it nice to work with. Um, I teach the languages, not frameworks. So when we study JavaScript, we study JavaScript. When we build interactive UIs that are dynamic in the browser, it's with JavaScript and it's just interacting directly with the DOM. You know, later we bring in, you know, 
a little teeny piece of jQuery just because it makes it nice to do the Ajax calls. We learn to do the Ajax calls by hand, but then you get the option of using that if you really want to. Since we're using Bootstrap, Bootstrap automatically has loads up jQuery, so there's no extra being loaded in order to do that. Um, someone's going to argue with me on that based on the slim, J, the slim jQuery versus the full jQuery, but, you know. Mm. <laughs> anyway, so we learn object-oriented programming and functional style programming in both JavaScript and C Sharp. Uh, I want you to understand what's going on in the language. I want you to understand when you use a framework, how does it work in the background? What's happening? If something breaks, how the heck do I fix it? Um, we do that by writing your own code. We don't just go pull down a bunch of libraries. We write our own code to handle it. Um, once you learn to write your own code, then you can pick up frameworks and libraries to make it easier and more productive. Um, in JavaScript, I stick to, and in C Sharp, we stick to the latest versions. I do, uh, we learn the, the pre-ES6 JavaScript first because that's where the bulk of, you know, client-side development has to run. Even if we use one of the transpilers like um, Babel or TypeScript, that's not what we're debugging at the end. So I want to make sure you've worked in the older style directly so that you're debugging what you have. You can write what you're debugging. Um, but then um, as part of the front end class, I also teach Node.js. So I do teach Node.js plus ASP in the back end. And so when we do Node, we do ES6 because there's no reason not to. We control the version of JavaScript that we have at that point. And in the world of C-sharp and .NET, I teach .NET Core, which is Microsoft's latest and greatest, and it's uh, platform independent. It will actually run on Microsoft's Windows, Linux, or the Mac OS. If you're not familiar with what Microsoft has been up to lately, that may be a bit surprising to you. Um, but that's, a, that's one of the cool bits, you know, since Windows has ceased to be at the only cash cow they have. Now that they have Azure for cloud deployments, uh, you can't run a cloud service and be specific to Windows or Linux or, you know, God help us, Apple if you wanted a server. Um, so you have to be able to support everything if you run yourself a, a large cloud provider. And so Microsoft has to support other people, other technologies, and they do. And so now on Azure, Anything goes. I've run a, a Microsoft user group in Gwinnett County for, since, I guess this is our 10th anniversary this year. And in the original, in the old days, uh, I had to be careful which topics I selected because they all, there were certain Microsoft topics and that's all people wanted. But with the advent of Azure and this new open uh, approach at Microsoft, I can schedule a talk on darn near any topic because Azure handles darn near every technology. So that's been a real benefit for me as a user group leader as well as someone who's working with the technology. Okay, so how do I do the classes? Um, the classes are either in person or remote. So. The remote classes I do via Skype for Business because we're part of Microsoft's Office 365 education plan. And so if you become one of the students, you get your own um, account with Office 365, which you keep as long as Microsoft lets me keep handing them out. And um, they get you online access to the Office suite. You don't get the downloadables, but you get the online version. You get a terabyte of space on OneDrive. You get your ccalearn.tech email address, and you have access to our OneNote notebooks where I do class notebooks for each class. And I can show you what those look like here on screen in just a minute. But I also record every single lecture in video format so that you can go back and watch it. And I've been told by students that sometimes it's the second and third watching of a lecture where you know they really, really get it. And that has been a, a huge help since I started doing the recordings. Um, but my philosophy is to teach you a little bit and get you to build stuff with that little bit. Rather than say, okay, we're going to spend six weeks you know, on this and then we're going to try to build something with it. I say, let's spend a couple hours thinking about something and then let's build something with it. So learn a little bit and use it immediately. Hands-on project work. I am a believer that the only way to learn to be a programmer or to get better at programming is by programming. Same would be true for writing. If you want to be a writer, you got to write. Uh, when possible, I do team projects in teams of four. And if you are a working developer, you understand why. It's because I want you to screw each other up. 
I want you to make the mistakes in class rather than on the job. And, you know, when we start doing agile methodology and we start doing, you know, merges, you know, one of my favorite jokes is, um, what do you call a group of one or more birds? Well, it's a flock. What do you call a group of, of two or more cows? It's a herd. What do you call a group of two or more programmers? It's a merge conflict. Hang on, we got it. Ta-da! Okay, that's it for the jokes for today. Sorry. Uh, anyway, we do continuous integration, continuous delivery, those kind of things. The, I try to teach the building things the way you're going to do it in a real-world setting. So if I were to start someone out, I wouldn't, you know, if, if I were to teach woodworking, for instance, I would not throw someone on this fancy machine that's going to do most of the work for them and cut a couple of their fingers off. Instead, I'm going to say, let's just go build a simple little birdhouse. You know, we're going to get a, a, a hammer, a nail, some nails and some wood and a handsaw, and we're going to build a little birdhouse birds don't want to live in. And the reason we do this is by learning a little bit and then building something, you get questions and you come ask me, how can I do something better? And at that point, your brain is prepped to learn what I'm going to teach because instead of me saying, you know, blah, 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 and then you say, okay, which of that was important? Have you ever had this experience? You're in class and the teacher is going on and on and on about something and someone goes, yeah, which of this is going to be on the test? Which of this is important? Which is this, which of these, which, what of this are we going to use in the real world? Inevitably, the teacher gets furious, right? All right, it's all important. You should remember it all. Well, you, the human brain doesn't work that way. We learn and we remember the things that are important, and we need to know what's important. We know, our brain knows it can't absorb everything at once. It needs some help. And so that's why if you build something and you see the problems you had while building it, you're ready to ask the question and learn how to build it better without you know having to go through this long, drawn-out process of trying to figure out what was important and what wasn't. You know because it's already come up. So building birdhouses teaches you about building things in general. It gives you a reason to want to learn more and shows you why you need to learn better techniques and tools. Progressive improvement, if you start out with simple projects and work your way forwards building more and more complex projects as you go, eventually you can build anything and something really nice. So when I teach, I have two different options. There's the full-time 40-hour week, which is probably not what we're talking about for the folks who signed up for this uh, talk here because that's usually for someone who is at a point in their life they can make a transition. It's a great option because you get to spend a full work day here with lecture in the morning, work on projects all afternoon. But what we're talking about here probably is the part-time. And I've got one of these starting up March 12th if you're interested. But the, this one we meet two evenings a week. In this case, for March, it'll be Monday and Wednesday from 6.30 till 9.30 in the evenings. And then on Saturday, half a day. It'll be from 9 till noon on Saturdays. You can either come in person or remote in, like I said. And like Ron, for you, if, if you were to think about a program like this, you probably don't want to drive over here from Sandy Springs. Although I did have a guy who drove over almost every time from Kennesaw. Uh, some people just really like being physically present in a classroom and... You know, it, it's really, it's, it's up to the person who's in the class which way they go on that one. But anyway, the, the important thing for you to remember is what it takes to advance in your career is hard work and not quitting. It's very easy to get frustrated and feel like you're, you're stuck where you are and you're going to have to just, just oh, I've got to accept the 3% raise again this year and I got passed over for the promotion. But the thing to remember is you know, when I give career advice, the number one piece of advice I can give is make sure that you're learning something new all the time and make sure that you are keeping your ear to the ground for what's going to be the next technology three years from now that companies are hiring for so that you can start, you know, prepping yourself. You'll make some wrong choices, but you'll try to pick enough that you can figure out what's going to be the next thing that will get you your next job and make sure that then once you have built some projects, the world can see. Other huge piece of career advice, build lots of projects that folks can see. Um, GitHub is your friend, um, as is you know publishing actual web apps or mobile apps, so that people can see that you've built something with that. And so at the point that a company says, we're looking for someone who's doing this new technology, you can be one of the people who says, yeah, on the side, I did these projects using exactly what it is you want have done 
And then you are in a position to negotiate a new salary. And now that's how you make your jumps up and you get where you want to be. Okay, so how to follow me on the web. My blog, I'm blogging two places these days. There's jeffa.tech and ccalearn.tech. I'm doing more of my blogging these days on CCA to Learn because that's our new website for the company. This is the one I was telling you about where you can go and do self-study kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to have lots of new courses rolling out over there. And that's ccalearn.tech as well. Our CCA website, the main one, is codecareacademy.com. On Facebook, you probably already know who we are on Facebook, seeing as we're on Facebook right now. And on Twitter, I have two accounts, Jeff00 and Code Career Acad. I try to be more professional on Code Career Acad and more snarky on Jeff00. Sometimes the snark goes in one way and the professionalism goes in the other one. So it, it, you, you can follow both if you want. If you would like to get a list of technical people who you can follow very quickly, if you go to the Code Career Acad and subscribe to the list that I have put out there, I keep a hundred and some people that I curate as a list of people I think do good technical posts. So that's pretty much it for the planned comments. So I'm going to stop real quick and ask if anyone else has questions I can answer. Knowing that there is a lag between me saying something and you seeing it of about 15 seconds, this makes it fun when we get to this portion of the evening because I go, hmm, are they answering? When are they going to hear me and when are they going to respond? So. I'm going to um, just kind of sit here and glare at the camera until someone asks a question. Now, we'll, we'll be shutting down here shortly, but I wanted to make sure that you had a chance to ask any more questions that were out there. Let me refresh to make sure I haven't just missed some. There's Ron. Ah, oh, thanks, Ron. It was a, Ron said it was a great answer, and I appreciate that. And like I said, if you want to talk specifics, just hook, you know, just DM me or whatever, and we'll we'll talk about your specific situation. I can give you recommendations. Well, I'm not seeing any further questions at the moment, so I'm going to give it just a second. Then we will shut down. I guess real quickly, I could show you guys a couple of things over here. While we wait to see if anyone has a question, I'll show you just kind of nuts and bolts of how I do my classes. I use OneNote very, very heavily. Uh, if you're not familiar with OneNote, it's Microsoft's little notebook kind of a setting here. So this is for my current full-time class. Each class gets its own notebook. And this is for the full-time class. And it's broken, as I said, into intro, front end, back end, and computer science. and in the back end sections where they are right now, if we look at each, each notebook has a class dates, so you can see on every single day of class what you're going to be covering. And then once we have that day's class, we come over here and each day has its own page. And on that page, we get you know the slides, the projects that we did in class, that I demoed in class, and then a link back to the live stream on Microsoft Stream. So that way, you can go and, um, oh good, I just noticed down here it says activate Windows. So just this morning when I showed up on a day when I planned to do a live stream, uh, Windows decided to do a, a major update. And so I just noticed that it's asking me to reactivate the Windows. That's nice. Okay, so if there are no further questions, I think, anyone who is interested in taking one of our classes, let me know. Um, you can reach me at jeffa at codecareeracademy.com. You can go to the website. You can go here on Facebook if you message our uh, Facebook page. That sounded really funny. Our Facebook page, if you send a message, I'll get that. Um, be happy to talk to you. Like I said, starts up on March the 12th, meets Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturday mornings, and we cover a lot of territory. I've had folks in my class ranging from... Um, absolute beginners to people with master's degrees in computer science and they've all said that they learned a lot because even if you've already completely learned the theory sometimes going back to basics and building these things by hand will help you solidify your knowledge and make you more confident which makes you a good choice to move up when it's time for that next step of advancement 
Um, with that, if there are no further questions, I believe I will wind it down. If you do have further questions, like I said, you can message me directly on Facebook and I will get back to you as quick as I can or come to the website and email me from there. Thank you everyone who attended. Thanks everyone who said hi and I look forward to talking to you later.